and markets have been translated into 27 languages. And his course here at Harvard on justice is a legendary course, the first that has become uh, televised and made available online and viewed by tens of millions of people. And Michael has become a pioneer in the use of technology to reach out across divides and bring people into a conversation about civil discourse. In a new BBC series, The Global Philosopher, he's leading a video link discussion on issues like immigration and climate change and the ethical aspects of hard questions. And his new book, which is coming in the fall, is The Tyranny of Merit, How the Promise of Moving Up is Pulling America Apart. Gwyneth Williams is a Spring 2020 Walter Shorenstein Fellow in Residence here at the Shorenstein Center. Uh, she recently left the BBC where she was in charge of its preeminent speech radio station, Radio 4. Before that, she was director of the English Language World Service, editor of the BBC Wright Lectures, and the head of BBC Radio Current Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sandel and Gwyneth Williams. Thank you, Nancy. I want to begin by putting a couple of questions to my friend Gwyneth Williams. Now, everybody here knows about the BBC. BBC Radio 4, which Gwyn led until just recently, is a special institution. And I want to make sure everybody here knows about the place of BBC Radio 4 in British life. It's, we don't have anything comparable here. It's, I would describe it as NPR, PBS, and The Atlantic all in one. <laughs> That's really what it is in terms of its impact and significance in the, in the mm. public life and in the intellectual life of British mm. broadcasting. Is that a fair mm. description? Well, or how would you describe well, it? Well, it runs like a river through British national life. Yeah. And um, I think you know, it, it attracts around 11 million listeners a week. And to our, our morning program, you've got to listen to it, really, if you want to um, keep up with what's going on in Britain. The Today program is 7 million listeners a week. But as Michael says, it's, it is unique um, because it, it isn't just about the news and the current affairs. Um, and it isn't just about that kind of national conversation. It also, I mean, I... When I was running Radio 4, I'd commissioned roughly 500 um, hours of documentaries a year um, to 300 uh, comedy shows a year, 600 hours of drama. So it's, it's something that... The point is, I suppose, look, it's, it's built on enlightenment principles, but with a renaissance approach. So you want to bump into something, and then it takes you to something else. Um, so I don't know if any of you listen to The Archers, which is our daily drama, um, but um, it's quite extraordinary, uh, the five million listeners a week. And we ended up, I ended up in the House of Commons talking about The Archers because we, we had a story uh, about coercive control um, on that drama. And it turned into a national <laughs> talking point, which actually was very helpful for mothers and babies in prisons, as it <laughs> turned out, which is maybe irrelevant to this <laughs> conversation, but it is, a, it is a rather special thing. Thank you, Michael, for saying that, but no, it, it is true. The, yeah. the BBC has a special place in the history and practice of truth as it's received and incorporated into the public life of a society. And you, I, I'd like you to say a little bit about your first exposure to the BBC and what it meant to you growing up, which was not in Britain. No, right. Um, so I, I had a very early encounter on the importance of lesson about the importance of truth, really, because I grew up in apartheid South Africa. So it wasn't unusual for me to come home from school and find my father, beloved father, on the roof of our house. Admittedly, he, he was an eccentric professor, um, 
not like any professors here, I'm sure, but on the roof of the house, <laughs> fiddling with a shortwave radio aerial so we could hear the news, because that trusted, um, a truthful uh, BBC News was a lifeline in a society where there's propaganda everywhere. So I was hit quite early with the importance of truth, and it seems to me I've been wrestling with the, that issue ever since all my life. And you led the, the BBC World Service before coming to BBC Radio 4, which is presumably what you were listening to in South Africa. Yes. It's ironic in a way. It's rather wonderful that I ended up um, uh, running the English World Service. Um, but uh, I suppose I, I, I took into the World Service um, the idea that the news agenda needs to be broader um, than it than it uh, currently wa than it was then, um, and I ended up in quite an argument um, o about rolling news. Um, they have a fantastic morning meeting um, at the World Service, so it's a nine o'clock meeting, and it's very quick because it's news. You know, uh, Nancy will know all about this. Very harsh. You whiz round, and and everybody. Uh, you have an astonishing briefing from South South Asia. Africa, West Africa, Latin America, you know, right round, and you know everything, and then, you, then the agenda's decided. But I pulled into that meeting quite quickly um, scientists and artists um, in order to stretch the news agenda, because I think even then it was beginning to feel that rolling news felt was rather a narrow approach. And by rolling news, you mean? I mean, Rolling news, I mean, the, what we've had for a few decades now, which is um, the sort of constant repetition hmm. of uh, a developing news story. It isn't to say you have to have, obviously, the news, and it's vital, and it's a key part of the BBC with its correspondence all around, what's absolutely vital. Um, but this, the pattern that's developed of the repetition um, and um, not just the repetition, but the heightening of emotion in the stories mm. um, that's gone together with the way we've seen journalism develop um, and it's gone together with the digital revolution, uh, ends up, I think, I actually think it's, it's, uh, it's almost a brutalization mm. of um, news and the way we come to understand it, which is quite a controversial thing to say. But um, I think the beginnings of that were, were sort of obvious to me, which is why I argued for a broader agenda. In the broader agenda, uh, I'm interested in what the broader agenda contributes to truth in covering world affairs and political affairs, because the rolling news, uh, you point out that it has a brutalizing effect, and that's an inescapable uh, impression looking at, at the cable news network, certainly in the United States, a kind of constant bombardment and reiteration and ginning up of sensation. Now, how, as you see it, does broadening news coverage to include science, the arts, culture, is that an adornment to getting the facts right? Or is that part of capturing and conveying the truth? I think the latter. Um, and I think that um, it's not only about broadening the agenda. It's very important to say that I'm not saying we should move from hard news stories. What I think very strongly is that that new stories need to be deepened. So what happens is, um, I mean, for example, um, uh, la last year um, I commissioned, I mean, you know, it's de deepened through history um, and then further it, through the addition of a sort of cultural understanding. So, for instance, um, take the Arab Spring, which feels like an awfully long time ago. Um, but when, when, when that news story was breaking, we were doing analytical pieces, 
of course, investigative pieces and reports, but what you would also uh, what what you could also do then is um, bring in a cultural understanding. So I commissioned and I ran um, Nagib Mahfouz, the Nobel Prize winning writer's uh, Cairo trilogy, for example. So that gave us three generations of people growing up in, in uh, Cairo. Um, it took you right up to the um, Egyptian Revolution from the beginning of the colonial um, period. And you, you could see through that the modernization of the society, the conflicts and the development of, of uh, the role of women and how all that worked. So you didn't have to do that. You could take the news, you could take the current affairs programs, you could take the essays, you could take all the other commissions, but also, if you really wanted to understand the society, yeah. you could dip into that, for example. Well, this, this makes me think about, I suppose it's a philosophical point about truth in news coverage, and that's to do with the relation between facts and truth. Are they one and the same? One way of testing this, here's a figure. Uh, I'll put it to this audience, see mm. what they know this, what this figure stands for. 16,241. Who knows what that is? Lies that, now how do yeah. they know that? <laughs> well, the Washington Post yeah. has a fact-checking uh, service and a website. That's actually the number of false or misleading statements that yeah. President Trump has told uh, during the first three years. So the, the total has increased since he surpassed the three-year mark in office. Now, the Washington Post and other news organizations have done a very effective job at fact-checking, at cataloging and analyzing and reporting false and misleading statements by this president. And yet my impression is that important though this is as a matter of reporting mm. and news coverage, yes. it hasn't changed very many people's views about President Trump or about the administration. Why do you suppose that is? Well, I think we've noticed the same, uh, that was a similar kind of thing during the Brexit referendum in 2016. Um, and which is that there's a developing thread which is away from uh, an uh, an understanding of the world in terms of, of uh, facts and rationality. And um, what happened is there were various very well-known things like the 350 million pounds that was on the back of the buses that was the amount of money that was supposed to be, uh, the UK was supposed to be paying to the European Union. In fact, it was a, a completely wrong statement. This, this was a gross figure, not a net figure. And we we challenged that and made it very clear. And indeed, I launched a, a program called More or Less, which actually went into the statistics of, 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 of all kinds of statistics and facts in a similar way that you just described. But I think that people, well, you know, there's two things. Did people know? So obviously BBC coverage was attacked, we were attacked. Right. We didn't tell people enough, we didn't challenge enough. We challenged pretty well, we made quite a lot of mistakes, I think, over the referendum, but generally speaking. But it isn't so much that. Did people know? The other question is, um, did people care? Um, and that's a bit more of a concerning thing. So people right. may know um, that the fact uh, is wrong, but there's a level of indifference or deliberately um, making decisions on, other, on another basis. I'd like to try out uh, a hypothesis about that, which is, gets a slightly different take. 
on how this works. Now, one way of seeing it is people just don't care about the facts. With fake news and with social media and with alternative facts, we live in a post-truth condition where the truth has ceased to matter in political life and in political persuasion. And the, the threat to democracy we see today consists in that and we'll only solve it if we get people to pay attention to the facts and agree on basic facts. I think that this is a misreading of what ails democracy. I think that there is a difference between facts, factual truth, and what we might describe as moral or rhetorical or spiritual truth. Now, the second kind of truth seems to me what you were getting at when you spoke about broadening news coverage to include coverage of the culture and of history and the arts. You were moving, I mean, this is my uh, reconstruction of what I take you to have been doing, Gwen you were broadening news coverage from factual truth to broader moral, rhetorical, persuasive truth. And I think that the reason we disagree about the facts is because we disagree about the moral questions in politics, not the other way around. I think it's not that we disagree about moral questions and how to judge public life and political figures because we don't agree on the basic facts. We disagree on the basic facts because we have a deep divide, morally and ethically, which actually is something that you and I both tried to explore in some of the experiments we'd, we've done with political discourse and argument on ethical questions. We have, and I wonder whether it's, this is a good moment um, uh, for us to um, play an example of a clip of one of the programs that, um, that you um, present called The Global Philosopher. Um, I remember you came to talk to me many years ago at the World Service and, and spoke so brilliantly about, or very persuasively, about trying to get to the, the, the root, the, the issue that lies underneath events. And um, that was years ago, but when, when I got to Radio 4, we, we were able to do it. And we could only most recently do this because of the brilliant studios, digital studio at Harvard. Um, so we recorded it right here. I think the first one was in 2016. But we've got a clip of... And just, um, just to explain, yeah. so we, we brought together, we had been doing a series of programs, yeah. The Public Philosopher, where we would gather audiences and have debates about the ethical issues lying behind the headlines. Yeah. But this studio enabled us to do this we, we, we had a wall of 60 monitors uh, enabled to uh, bring together people from 30 or 40 countries at a time to engage in these discussions. Yeah, the quite, uh, quite extraordinary. Um, but really, uh, it, it's probably the, one of the very best things, I think, that we've run. Because it, f it, it, it made a global, it, we were touching on the possibility of a global conversation for the very first time, but also we were trying to deepen the agenda in this yeah. way we've been, we've been trying to describe. And um, I think I it's impossible really to overstate the importance of this sense that um, people want more. People want more, um, people are hungry for knowledge and learning I've found in my travels, uh, for particularly for the World Service. Um, I remember being in Ghana, for example, and the very young boy in his 20s said to me, um, 
we need to hear the truth and you give us the truth. It's hard often, and, but thank you for that. I have to listen to, and he was talking about other coverage, not just the news coverage, because I want to understand how my country is. I can only do that in comparison with other countries. Mm. And also, as a, as, a, as a fuller human being and a human experience. So I think we should maybe play this clip. What right. do you think? And Michael? just to explain that this yeah. particular program was uh, a free debate speech. of free speech yeah. and hate speech and uh, how, yeah. how to think about them. Yeah. Uh, let's bring back Marion and put uh, Kyung Hae and Marion uh, together on the screen. Uh, Marion, what do you say? What do you think? That there's been um, research that shows that, like, enduring microaggressions on a daily basis and um, having to hear that you're, like I was saying before, humanity is being undermined, that is a kind of violence that takes a toll and does damage to people and groups of people. It isn't so much that you know, everyone's just sensitive and coddling and this sort of sticks and stones may break my bones is not valid here. It genuinely does. Words can cause a great deal of psychological harm. What about that, Kyung Hae? Well, I believe that Copernicus gave offense to religion and science by challenging the position of the sun and the earth. Martin Luther King gave offense to U.S. society and norms by challenging racism and women are giving offense to a male-dominating society by challenging inequality. And when you say protection, you assume that the people are weak and cannot defend themselves. But shielding women from misogyny or shielding ethnic minorities from racism, isn't that paternalistic rather than being progressive? All right, let's bring Frankie in Vancouver back to the screen to, um, to reply to Kyung Hae. I'm absolutely shocked because I feel that academic discussion gets in the way of reality and truth. And if Marion is on a subway in Somalia and someone shouts at her for the head garment that she is wearing, that is not helpful, Kyung, from South Korea. That is not leading to her to feel empowered. That is not discourse. That is hate speech and that is disgusting. Do not say what Martin Luther King said when he was... Uh, protesting for his rights was hate speech because what we are discussing is if a person should be able to degrade someone on their ethnicity, on their sexuality, on the way that they look. And I believe that what Marion chooses to wear because of the color of her skin should never be a reason to put hate speech against her. Kyung Hae. But I believe that offensive speech can only be defeated by more free speech, not limiting offensive speech. Therefore, free speech should not be limited, but rather expanded. Marion. I think we're confusing being offensive and like hate speech with just being disruptive. If you have a controversial idea, but you substantiate it really well, that doesn't make it hate speech. And um, that isn't something that we're arguing about being banned. But when um, someone's being attacked on the basis of something they can't change and it's not contributing to a dialogue or actually furthering anything, then that in itself is, is damaging and hate speech. So here we had... Uh, uh, as people could see, a, a round of debate among participants from Somalia, South Korea, and Canada. 60 different countries. Yeah, and yeah. all we had 60 over the, over the course mm. of the series to try, uh, it was an experiment, mm. but to try to see what reasoned, but sometimes passionate, public discourse could be on some of the most vexing questions that mm. we are wrestling with in democratic societies. So, Michael, if I can just take back control a little bit, Please. this point, as we say in the UK, <laughs> um, I know it's, we don't know how it's going to go, um, either here or, or there, but um, I remember the very first one of these programs that we did, um, there was, you, you you refer, this was, and this one was about borders, migration. No. Do you remember that? No. And you said at the end, you quoted um, Rousseau. And uh, you said, well, you know, the famous thing that how can we care about calamities half a world away? Um, and you said, but, but, but here we are. Um, what, is, what happens when you can see those calamities unfold in real time? And 
and when you can have a global dis discussion, such as we're having 60 people around the world. Um, so isn't that, and I th I, you said something specific like, isn't that a glimpse of a rational global discourse? Yeah. And, you know, it was tremendously exciting that this was 2016. And I wonder now, looking at that, this seems almost like a fantasy um, mm. that we can have a global, rational discourse. Right. Uh, I mean, it's a good thing to, to be looking for what lies beneath an event. But it, we feel to be in a very different world now, don't you think, Michael? Yes, we're divided not only globally, not only between countries, but within countries, mm -hmm. as we see in the politics of our respective societies. And uh, the question is, how can we begin to address this deep polarization where people not only uh, don't know how to reason together mm. about big civic questions, but seem not to agree even on basic facts. And one, I guess there are two approaches to that. One, going back to these two accounts of what's gone wrong or how to address it, is to say, first we have to bring everyone to see the same facts, and then we can have the moral debates. Then mm -hmm. we can disagree. And I think that misdescribes um, the source of the polarization. I think we first have to uh, learn uh, how to begin to argue with one another on the basis of civility and mutual respect, but sometimes genuinely to argue and disagree in public, to reason together we will find ourselves appealing to facts about which there will be dispute. Mm. And in the course of those disputes, we may be impelled to test the various readings of facts. So the facts do come into it. But the facts, I think, that matter in politics are as contested as the opinions. And I think we should recognize that. Political persuasion is a, as much about persuading our fellow citizens about the way things are, really, as about how they ought to be morally. Mm. And so I think there's an interplay between facts on the one hand and moral argument and persuasion on the other. And I think the only way to try to find our way to a better kind of public discourse is to recognize the interplay between facts and moral argument and political persuasion. And to do that, we have to begin to build our capacity to reason together about big ethical questions that matter, which is not an easy thing. But how do we f fight our way um, out of the different silos that, that people find themselves in? Yeah. Um, and also in, uh, build a, a, a public space uh, to, to, to draw people in? Because there is, I mean, the dogmatism, um, every, uh, the, 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 the dogmatic approach, and also there's an element of what I think the Russians call it vranyo, which is telling an, an untruth that everyone knows is an untruth. Mm. You know that I know that you know that it isn't true. Mm -hmm. But we still speak in this almost a surreal way. We will build a wall and Mexico will pay for the wall. And everyone knows this isn't going to happen. Yeah, the people who were applauding didn't really believe that Mexico no. would pay for the wall. No, so But they applauded because this is what Machiavelli referred to effectual truth. It was an effectual truth, even though no one actually thought Mexico will write a check and pay for the wall. Nobody thought that, well, but they, they knew what he meant. They thought, those who were uh, attracted by that mm -hmm. claim, when Trump made it during the campaign, they knew what he meant. He was not stating a fact or making a prediction. He was making an argument that touched on their experience and their convictions and their hopes and their fears. And they knew that. So 
in a way for fact checkers to come along and say, mm. and now he's made a factual claim, mm. Mexico is paying for the wall through the, the new trade agreement with Mexico. And the fact checkers rightly point out that that's not true. Well, it's not true as a matter of fact, but it, it has a kind of claim that is rooted in a certain political argument. I and I think that's the level at which we have to take it on. So we have to look for that. But Michael, is to think that we can engage people in rational argument and debate, we've got to get people to the point where, uh, or we have to have a, 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 a situation where people understand the need for that engagement. Right. And I think that's, the, that's really the kind of um, society that you have to build through, through civil society, through um, creating a space where, um, I mean, I guess we have it to a certain extent um, in England, a little in Britain, a little more than, than here, because we have a wide um, a public uh, a, a space where there's uh, public service broadcasting uh, is more widely accepted. Yeah. I mean, even now, uh, for instance, on Radio 4, the crossover with Daily Telegraph readers, for example, which is the, the leading right-wing newspaper, is uh, more or less 100%. So you do have a mix of people in there in this space. Right. But the challenge of getting people and drawing people in so that you can begin this rational, this attempt um, to have a proper conversation about about uh, the things that are important to people. I think maybe you have to hang on to the ballast that we've got. So history, things uh, deep down go to the past. Go, you know, the arts and poetry, you know, the Auden poem, the famous poem, 1st September um, 1939, um, when he said, I sit, uh, something like, I sit in the dives, on 52nd Street, uncertain and afraid, um, and see the clever hopes uh, fade on a um, low, dishonest decade. And, you know, he said, for example, that poetry and art, although it can't, um, it can't make us uh, better human beings in any way, he said what it does is make us more human, because it's about making us more aware of our surroundings. And he said, one thing I'm certain, and, and this is a quote, um, it does make us less difficult to deceive. And I think building that more rounder aspect mm. does he can help in that way. But it's a tall order. It is a tall order. Shall we invite some questions and Let's do see that. maybe I don't, I don't have a fully satisfactory answer Gwyn, no. to your challenge, but I'm hoping maybe someone they will. in the discussion will oh or will at least yes. provoke us. Yes, I meant us. to be looking at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I wanted to do just before opening to the, uh, yes. to the questions is um, I've got, I've, I'd like to read a very short quote, which is by Francis Bacon from his essay on truth. And I ran this on Radio 4 as a series um, on truth last year. And this is what he had to say 400 years ago. Hmm. So, 400 years ago. Each day brings new news, fresh causes for outrage, claims and counterclaims. New forms of media circulate unverifiable and scurrilous rumors about public figures and events. Rival states accuse each other of interference and suspect their own citizens of foreign allegiances. Conspiracy theories snowball 400 years ago. <laughs> wow. So let's open to questions, absolutely. And we've got microphones. Uh, so if people who have questions would like to go to one of the microphones, feel free. And while people, oh, yes. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. I'm a, a graduate of uh, Harvard College and uh, the School of Education. My question is, um, so my father and all seven of his brothers and, and my mother, among my mother and father, seven people served in the military. And 
What is notable about the post-war generation is that they engaged in a common set of activities and faced a common challenge, which was tyranny. Right. And so my question is, we no longer participate collectively right. in anything. And, what do you th and we've also dropped civic education from most high school curricula. Right. So is the answer, or is one of the answers, to create forms of civic engagement, like civic education, to educate people about common principles or national service in some form, is, is that a potential salve to our divided selves? Yes, All right. and what's your name, please? Uh, Stephen Smith. Stephen, yes. The, I mean, my answer mm. would be emphatically yes for the following reason. If factual truth is not independent and autonomous on its own, if it's bound up with persuasion, with rhetoric, with moral and spiritual truth, then the only way to deliberate about truth is in a common life, it is in a shared common life. And this goes back when this, mm. to a point you were making about common spaces. We lack the common spaces and experiences that equip us even to disagree with one another, never mind to come to points of agreement. Even disagreeing and arguing and debating requires a certain kind of shared experience. And so if, if factual truth is bound up with moral and rhetorical and persuasive truth, it must also be connected to certain shared experiences. And if that's right, then part of the challenge, maybe even the crisis of truth in politics today is not just that people are wrong about the facts, but that the lives we live together uh, separate us rather than engage us in common experiences. What do you think? I think, I think clearly if we can, if, if people can come together in collective spaces, that's great, but I think it's, um, how do we get people to come uh, together in a collective space? Well, some of the conversation now is about having a little less um, politics and a little more activity in other areas, and I think that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, there's so many aspects to being human, um, and, um, and um, political life is, is part of it. It brings to mind one example of a debate that we have today, the debate about climate change. Mm. Now, very often, those who are urging stronger action and commitment on climate change say the problem is those who oppose it, those who want to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement, they don't believe in science. It's a problem about fact. We just have to bring, you know, in fact, it's interesting in, if you listen to political debate about climate change, those who favor action on climate change have begun using the phrase, I believe in science. Have you heard that phrase? I believe in science. You hear it in the campaign. You heard it in the last campaign. Now that's a kind of strange formulation, I believe in science, because it asserts the claims of science at the cost of making science a matter of faith. Mm. Is it arguable, is the point, <laughs> well, which is really extraordinary. And so, and, and I've, I've encountered uh, scientists, distinguished scientists, who are just frustrated that the country isn't listening to them. Mm. And why are they not listening to us? Well. I think it goes back to this difference between factual truth 
and persuasive truth, moral truth, rhetorical truth. If s scientists do have a very important part to play in public discourse, but it can't consist simply in asserting their own authority. They have to enter into the worries and concerns. They've got to try to figure out why people who resist their science but have a stake in resisting it. What's that about? And that's a political discussion. Yes, but it's, again, it's a very... I'm, I mean, for example, we've had a lot of discussions about climate change and how we covered it at the BBC. And, um, you know, we, you, what you have to do, the rule is, the preponderance of evidence is on the side of X, but we may discuss why. But be very clear that, that this is where the evidence lies. Right. Um, but it doesn't then mean you can't still have a conversation that is broader than that. Right. But you have to ha inform people so that they're in a position to make up their mind, choose um, to listen and to, and to decide. Yeah. It's w w there, w there was an interesting survey of opinion about the people who believed and who didn't believe that the attention to climate change is exaggerated and overblown. If you believe that truth is st strictly a matter of fact, detached from moral argument or persuasion, mm -hmm. then you would think that the better educated the people are, the more they agree on climate change. But that's not the case. Pollsters have found, surveys have found that in the U.S. Uh, there is a partisan divide on climate change that we know. But the partisan disagreement about climate change increases with greater education rather than decreases. The more people know, the, the better educated people are, and the more scientific background they have, the greater the disagreement about whether climate change is a problem or not, not less. And that supports the, the argument, in a way the perverse argument that I'm trying mm. to make, mm. which is that facts are not morally self-sufficient, that our factual disagreements can only be addressed through learning how to reason and persuade one another about moral and political questions, not the other way around. The gap increases the more people know about science. Did you find that surprising? Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. It's a counterintuitive finding. Among people with limited scientific knowledge, there, there's much less yeah. of, a, of a gap. Yeah. But there's a danger in this, of course, as well, which is that Beca because um, something which is so obviously uh, so evident in the in the facts and through the science um, is challenged, right. people then become themselves as scientists less inclined to interrogate their own work, for mm. example. So it's a very negative uh, cycle because you know you have to be your own biggest critic uh, in a field and in, and, and in interrogate it. And if you're too defensive and dogmatic, then that's inimical to the exploration of truth, isn't it, in a field? So it's damaging on more than one count. Although the dogmatism, well, here we should. Uh, yeah, we've I was going to, to say the dogmatism may yeah. may exist on both sides. Yes. M may exist on both sides. Come but on. But we've got okay. Who else do we over here? Yeah. <coughs> Hi, I'm uh, Eric Mank, and I'm over at the Ed School as well. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to go back to your statement about Donald Trump and um, build a wall in Mexico will pay for it. So can you help me understand what uh, a more moral approach or response to that kind of a statement would be? So can you go down sort of one level from, yeah. from what you were talking about? I just, I'm, I, don't, I can't get it. What I'm suggesting is that the way to respond to that, of course the fact checking is important. I'm not suggesting that the Washington Post, New York Times should not do careful fact checking. But it's not enough 
to actually engage in the democratic project of political persuasion. To do that, I think we need to ask, why is it that those who applaud that line and support that idea, well, Mexico will pay for the wall, we want the wall, and so on. Why is it? What is it about their lives and their experience that makes them feel threatened and even uh, ignored, disrespected by the, uh, the view of national borders that mainstream politicians have made available to them? Now, that's a political question. It's a contestable question. There are competing answers to it. But even posing that question invites a certain kind of dialogue between those who find that statement false and abhorrent and those who applaud it. And we have very little of that dialogue today. That's what I'm suggesting. Let's take so, some more. Yeah. Uh, standing next to me is Daniel Bergman, who is a student at GSAS. And his question is, do we need to give up on winning in order to create a culture of discourse? If we look at the uh, increase in peace in Northern Ireland and our hopes for peace in the Middle East, we want to, people to give up on the idea of winning hmm. and prefer peace to winning. Is that what has to happen here? Is winning inimical to kind of dialogue, reasoned dialogue, mm. and the example mm. of, sort of Ireland. What do you think? Interesting question. Well, I think it's pretty difficult to get people to move away from wanting to win. Um, you only had to watch this debate last night to realize how badly people want to win. Um, mm. But uh, I think um, it's the art of diplomacy. It's the art of compromise. It's a question of trying to move forward in these extraordinary intractable issues, um, you're going to have s uh, people who will be very clear about the direction, but you will also have to have a lot of other activity going on to try and get there. And if people are just making statements and posturing, we'll get nowhere with it. Now, uh, uh, I'm tempted, well, there was another example I wanted to raise with a clip, but, um, well, maybe, maybe it can, shall we do, shall it. We do yeah. it? Winning, should we give up on winning for the sake of peace or reasoned public discourse? Hmm. I would say not necessarily. It depends what the stakes are. And that's a moral question. One example of a powerful assertion when you were talking about broadening uh, coverage to include culture and the mm -hmm. arts. One example of the potence of moral and rhetorical truth is offered up by music, especially music that has a political purpose and point. And sometimes that a con music that conveys for political purposes moral or spiritual claims about truth. Take a historic example, the US Civil War. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, most Americans know the lyrics by heart. What's the truth status of, the, of that famous anthem, the anthem of the North, the abolitionist anthem, the battle hymn of the Republic? Whitney Houston performed that song in 1991 when US troops returned in a kind of celebration of heroes, it was called, after the first Gulf War. 
We have a clip of Whitney Houston's rendition of the beginning of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And as we listen to it, I'd be interested to hear what you think about the truth status of this anthem. Please stand and sing this song with me, would you please? It's the Battle Hymn of Republic. Um, you know the words, I know you do. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed his faithful lightning up his tail. singing about truth. And so did those soldiers marching into battle, those Union soldiers during the Civil War. His truth is marching on. And for them, the future of truth, whether truth had a future, depended on who won that war. Now, what about that sense of truth? Does that well, we'll put it first to the mm. group, and then I want to put it mm. to you, Let's. Glenn. Uh, two questions, I suppose. First, do you find it inspiring, the song? And the second, do you find it true? It has a message. Do you find it true? How many find it inspiring, first of all? And how many find it true? How many consider it true, the message? Well, that's the question. <laughs> that's the question. What nobody, every, almost everyone found it inspiring, but no one I saw was willing to say that it was true. What does that tell? What does that tell us, Gwen? What do you make of it? Well, I think. It's the power, it's the, power um, the extraordinary power uh, of symbols, of music, of art uh, that's brought to bear um, to, support an, uh, uh, to support a point of view. And is it about truth or is that merely metaphorical, merely rhetorical? Is it really about truth? It's not about truth. It isn't? No, I don't think so. Or Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, yeah. we hold these truths to be to self-evident self that all men are created equal. <laughs> now, was he not really talking about truth, would you say? That was just a kind of rhetorical flourish? No, he believed that thoroughly. And it's he was either truth. right or he was yeah, wrong. Yeah, he was right. And so, yeah. and so, were, so were those who were marching Fighting into battle, truth. Yeah. they were, yeah. So it is about truth. It is about truth. Oh, Michael, you've done your philosophical thing here. <laughs> we're a long way from straightforward journalistic truth, well, but you're absolutely right to go there because this is where we, this is what we need to do to understand this, this properly. This is, our, but our political yeah. condition yeah. is fraught with isn't it? I mean, this is my question, I suppose, fraught with this uh, deeper, more contestable notion yes. of truth. 
to do with moral truth, yes. persuasive truth, rhetorical truth, which is more than fact-checking can reach. And we've and got to find it, yeah. because otherwise we're sort of locked into this polarized, fragmented worldviews, is the thing, yeah. Which, well, that's the suggestion. I think we have time for yeah. another, yeah. Hi, I'm Tim Radon. I'm a Cambridge resident. Um, thanks a lot for doing this and for coming out. When it comes to the questions of you know, how journalists need to adapt and dig deeper, shine a light, and provide context, um, I read this article in the Washington Post December 17th about the Russian disinformation network that yeah. uh, was spreading um, lies about Ambassador Yovanovitch. And they cited uh, this web analysis from Grafika, which is um, based in New York. It's highly specialized, uses artificial intelligence. So I guess my question is, and personally, I appreciated knowing that. I thought it was useful context for me to understand major events. But as I understand, it's, it's still highly specialized skills. But then also the question is, is there a new set of ethics? Does this need to be um, become part of just standard practice in journalism to find out who the interlocutors are on social media and do some kind of, you know, in a time of information warfare and whatnot? Um, and how do you do that with... And, protect you know the integrity of actual people who are have complaints who may accidentally be repeating what is basically Russian propaganda but um, they're not doing it out of ill intent thanks well it's extremely it? it's extremely <laughs> difficult to assess the truth of something without um, being able to to un in an anonymous situation, if something's anonymous, this is the major problem with, with social media. So it's very hard for people to decide what is truthful and where they should place their trust. Um, but I just think, I think, um, I mean, I really don't know the answer to this. It's too uh, challenging. I think, you, you know, we have to use our best endeavors to ascertain a truthful source um, and and to expose uh, as much the, of the disinformation as we can, and through um, through the sources that we that we've got, um, in order that people the the tragedy and uh, the difficulty is, people need to make choices about their lives, about where to place their trust, about how to live, on the basis of our journalism. So, you know, and and you have to. Um, uh, provide that in as best and as dispassionate a way as you possibly can. And it's immensely challenging, as, as we've all been saying here tonight. So... Let's bring in one more. Yes. Thank you for holding this discussion tonight. I'm Mackenzie, and I'm a Watertown resident. Um, in applying these philosophical principles of truth to our political and our personal lives, how are we going to avoid the classic problems of absolutism and skepticism and disagreement? It seems when we're discussing and getting into the discussions of these moral truths, it shouldn't be something where epistemic peers who disagree should just abstain from judgment because they're incredibly personal. But also it's the deep convictions in our own correctness that's driving this polarization. So practically, how are we to navigate this issue of truth? By, yeah. <laughs> by taking on and engaging with the deep convictions of those with whom we disagree, not because we can know in advance that we can change their minds, after all, Maybe they're right. Maybe we'll change our minds. Or maybe we'll stick to our positions, but see their views and see our interlocutors more clearly, more sympathetically, as a result of this kind of engagement and dialogue. Now, It's a bit like um, I could give um, a, a say something that uh, Daniel Barenboim, the uh, sort of musician, uh, wonderful musician, s said. Um, and you know he has the West East Divan Orchestra of Israelis and, and Jewish, Jewish young people. 
And what he said is that for an orchestra to work, you have to, um, every instrument has to make way at a certain time for uh, the least instrument. So all the strings have to stop so you can hear the single voice of the flute. The point is, for the music to work at all, the point is not, um, the point is not to agree or always to engage, but the point is to listen. So you have to listen to the narrative of the other in order to make the whole work. So I think, I mean, there's a starting point um, is to really uh, uh, listen. I, I think that, um, Gwyn, you should have the last word, but before you do, <laughs> before you do, um, an observation backed up by a poem. The observation is, listening to your account of your rich and, and impressive experience at the World Service and at BBC Radio 4, I, I hear a tension in your account of what it is to convey the news and to convey the truth. On the one hand, giving the news straight, getting the facts right, factual truth. But at the same time, and you were a pioneer in this, broadening coverage to include historical and cultural and artistic broadcasts, not as a kind of adornment or entertainment with the news to one side, but as a way of conveying truth. I wonder if there's a tension between those two different accounts of what it is to convey the truth. And in support of my uh, suspicion, my hunch, mm -hmm. um, I want to put to you this short poem from Emily Dickinson. And the first line is at odds with the idea that telling the full truth about the way things are can simply be a matter of telling the news straight. Because the first line in the poem is, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Not straight, slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children, eased with explanation kind, there's rhetoric, mm -hmm. the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. It's <laughs> <That was> wonderful. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's extraordinary. That's the cultural side of it what is. you yeah. brought to the BBC. And its notion, and your notion of imagining the truth, truth. Imaginative, imaginative truth. Imaginative truth. I think, I think that the complexity of living in the world and of moving beyond yourself into a body politic and into the nation state and beyond that um, is such that you have to bring everything to bear on trying to understand um, how we live together and what is happening. And people, people are able to bring different expertise and different um, knowledge to, to the party, and it's all relevant. So the question is, how do you distill that and convey it somehow in this cross multidisciplinary, crossing borders and boundaries, geographically as well as culturally and subject-wise? And this is the endeavor, really, and it's a pretty big one. <laughs> but I'll close it down then. So I've just been here a couple of days, and I've certainly picked up quite a lot of pessimism about Western democracy, or democracy generally. Um, 
But I thought that I would just close um, with a short clip from a wreath lecturer, a fellow wreath lecturer, um, because Michael, I claim him really as a BBC wreath lecturer. Um, and this is from someone uh, from an entirely different field, but he finds hope in all kinds of ways, uh, unexpected ways. And I suppose the question is, must we be this pessimistic? Can you play hey, the clip? Are you going to tell us who, or we have no, to? No, oh, I'm going right. to play the clip. Can okay. you play the clip, um, Trevor? Currently, I'm working with my Cambridge colleague, Malcolm Perry, an Andrews Drominger from Harvard, on a new theory based on a mathematical idea called supertranslations to explain the mechanism by which information is returned out of the black hole. The information is encoded on the horizon of the black hole. Watch the space. <laughs> what does this tell us about whether it is possible to fall in a black hole and come out in another universe? The existence of alternative histories with black holes suggests this might be possible. The hole would need to be large, and if it was rotating, it might have a passage to another universe. But you couldn't come back to our universe. So, although I'm keen on space flight, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> the message of this lecture is that black holes ain't as black as they are painted. They are not the eternal prisons they were once thought. Things can get out of a black hole, both to the outside and possibly to another universe. So, if you feel you are in a black hole, don't give up. <laughs> There's a way out. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I just want to close down, and Michael, thank you very much for being dragged away from your, no, from your you. wonderful new book we're all <laughs> looking forward to. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for putting on this forum. Um, it's been extraordinarily interesting. And thank you so much for your brilliant, only predictably brilliant Harvard questions. And Trevor, thank you for being up there in the box, and Kathy for organizing it. And thank you so much, Nancy, for inviting me to Harvard. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well done. Well done. <laughs>